Welcome to Archaeoed, a podcast about the civilizations of the ancient Americas. You know, the ones that Western history books spend about a page discussing. I'm your host, Dr. Ed Barnhart. I've been an archaeologist, an explorer, and a seeker of esoteric knowledge all around the Americas for over 30 years now. This podcast is just me, freed from the lecture podium and talking like we're just having a beer together. Sometimes I'll tell stories of my adventures. Other times I'll share what I've learned about the various cultures that were here before Columbus. Basically, it'll be anything I feel like talking about, because this is my podcast, Beholden the No One. I'm just having fun with it. I hope you do too. So without further ado, kick back, relax, and let's get started. Season 4, Episode 8, Poverty Point. To start this episode, I'm going to assume that I can't surprise you by stating that there are ancient pyramids in North America. You also know that they've been traditionally called mounds, which I think diminishes their importance and monumentality. I admit it may be a stretch to call them pyramids from a strictly geometric point of view. But if we're going to deny them the pyramid label, then we have to scratch everything in Mesoamerica, South America, Mesopotamia, India, and China off the pyramid roll call too. Lately, I've been favoring the term pyramid mound as a middle ground. I'm running that one up the flagpole for public comment. What do you think? Whatever you want to call them, the largest ever built in North America is Monk's Mound in Cahokia. It stands 100 feet tall, and its basal dimensions are 955 by 775 feet. That makes its base roughly the same size as the Great Pyramid of Giza's. It was constructed around 900 CE, roughly 1100 years ago. But here's where I'm going to try to surprise you. The second largest pyramid mound in North America was built 2,300 years earlier than Cahokia. Mound A at the site of Poverty Point currently stands 71 feet tall, and its basal dimensions are 710 by 660 feet, and it was built around 1430 BCE. Volumetrically, it's 8.4 million cubic feet of dirt. The term mound does not apply to that amazing 3,500-year-old structure. Okay, as I like to do, let's start by setting Poverty Point in time and space with the five W's. The five W's usually start with who, but I'm going to jump to where first. So where is Poverty Point? It's along the Bayou Macon in northern Louisiana, just a few miles off the Mississippi River. That's right, America's oldest pyramids are in Louisiana. Okay, now who? Who built it? Archaic hunter-gatherer people built it, a people who we thought only gathered in small nomadic bands. We call them simply Poverty Point Culture, but their range extends well beyond the city itself. Next, what is Poverty Point? Well, it's an ancient city with a population of at least 5,000 people. Archaeologists have found hundreds of houses on raised platforms around a giant plaza, the aforementioned pyramid, and five other pyramid mounds all arranged over an area covering about four square miles. There are those against referring to Poverty Point as a city, but I would remind them that the ancient city of Jericho had a population of only about 3,000 people and covered an area of only about six hectares. So next, when is Poverty Point? Mound B was constructed at about 1730 BCE, and the city was abandoned around 1100 BCE. That's 600 years of continuous occupation. I'd call that a pretty successful place. Finally, why? 
Why would a bunch of pre-agriculture, pre-ceramic hunter-gatherers build a city? Well, that's a loaded question. Too many people approach this question with the assumption that archaic hunter-gatherers were incapable of such a feat. Popular theorists like Graham Hancock assert that they must have been taught how to build a city from some far older advanced civilization, one that's completely vanished from the earth now. I readily admit that we don't have all the answers, but making up stories to explain what we don't understand is at best irresponsible, and in the case of Poverty Point, it robs Native America's ancestors of their amazing achievements. Why did they build Poverty Point? Well, let's start with the fact that they could and analyze its benefits from that foundation. Before I get into the details of the site, let's talk about its modern history and discovery for a minute. The area was given the name Poverty Point in the 1850s by Philip Gouillard. Gouillard bought the property in 1837 to be a cotton plantation. Records state that he had a cotton gin and seven slaves to work the land. The name Poverty Point is terrible, but apparently it was kind of a running joke among the area's plantation owners. The cotton farms along the Mississippi River were very productive, but the ones out in the upland bayous, not so much. Other area plantations were named things like Hard Times and Hard Bargain, so the name Poverty Point was kind of a pattern of disparaging jokes. Boy, I wish someone had named the archaeological site something cooler, but it's embedded in the literature now. As the French pioneers of Louisiana would say, c'est la vie. None of the plantation's records say anything about ancient settlement. They either didn't know didn't care, or didn't want to acknowledge it. The first person to publish its identity as an ancient settlement was the infamous and industrious Clarence B. Moore. I've spoken about Clarence before, but just to recap, he was a millionaire from Philadelphia who made his money in the 1880s from his family's paper company. And yes, he was a millionaire in the 1880s, which means he was obscenely wealthy for the times. He retired from the paper business early and spent the rest of his long life pursuing his passion, which was archaeology. He had a steamboat custom-built for his expeditions, 85 foot long, with space for his crew and all their equipment, and of course, for whatever treasures he found. For over two decades, he steamed up and down every river and bayou of the American Southeast, looking for mound sites. When he found them, him and his crew would pop out of his steamboat, which he aptly named the Gopher, and start digging for graves and artifacts. In fact, there's barely a single major mound site in all of the Southeast that Clarence Moore didn't excavate first. In the case of Poverty Point, he was the very first to recognize it as an ancient settlement. He steamed up the Bayou Macon in 1915, but only spent about two days at the site. Finding no ceramics and no burials, he quickly gave up and left. Good for Poverty Point. And just as an aside, Clarence Moore died in St. Petersburg, Florida at the age of 84, and the Gopher sunk in Tampa Bay shortly after. After Clarence Moore, it wasn't until the 1950s that anyone excavated at Poverty Point. Luckily, this time it was a formerly trained archaeologist, a man named James Ford. At first, he didn't even recognize Mound A. It was so huge, he believed it wasn't man-made. So in 1955, he trenched Mound B, a mere 21-foot-tall structure. Carbon-14 dating was still in its infancy, but his mixed results included surprisingly old dates. He then got the Vicksburg Corps of Engineers to share their aerial photography, and that's when we first realized how big the site truly was. Excavations continued sporadically until the state of Louisiana officially bought the site in 1972. 
From then on, it's been a protected site, slowly investigated and consolidated over the years. Still, it wasn't until the 1990s that careful soil coring and dating made the site's incredible age undeniable. UNESCO chimed in in 2014, naming it a World Heritage Site. It's now past time for the world to recognize Poverty Point, but it's been slow coming. During my last visit, the head ranger named Mark Brink told me that he finally had to look me up because so many people said that Ed Barnhart of Great Courses had sent them. Good, let's see how many more people I can reach through this podcast. I'll take a short commercial break right here, and when I return, we'll talk about the site itself in detail. By now, anyone listening knows how deeply involved I am in Maya calendar studies. I've made a website, an iPhone app, an annual wall calendar, and now I'm thrilled to announce the most complex Maya calendar tool I've ever made, barsanddots.com. I didn't actually make it, more like commissioned it. The coding was done by software engineer Matt Neal, and that code was based on the original Bars and Dots program created by Sid Hollander in the 1980s. Bars and Dots is the most sophisticated Maya calendar conversion program ever made, and it's free for anyone to use. And guess what? This is the 13th commercial I've made. That's got to be a good Maya calendar omen, right? Just log on to barsanddots.com and start playing with it. So Poverty Point has North America's first truly massive pyramid. There were even earlier sizable mounds, but nothing as big as Mound A. It's tempting to say that Poverty Point was the primeval city of North America, the one that inspired the next 3,000 years of pyramid cities and massive earthworks. But it's just not that simple. On the one hand, it's the standard location and formation of all the cities to come, along a major waterway with a plaza, major buildings, and residential structures all in a tight cluster along its banks. But then, major standard elements are missing. Poverty Point lacks the defensive perimeter walls surrounding every Mississippian city, and its pyramid mounds have no burials inside, not even one. Perhaps the biggest disconnect is Poverty Point's lack of intensive agriculture. The Mississippian cities all had vast areas of cornfields. And many publications about those later cities cite agricultural productivity as the major factor in their choice of location. But intensive agriculture was still millennia away in Poverty Point's time. Heck, even in Mesoamerica, intensive agriculture had just begun. Poverty Point, with a start date of roughly 1700 BCE, is contemporaneous with the first Olmec city, San Lorenzo. And San Lorenzo was Mesoamerica's first major settlement that depended on intensive corn agriculture. The other major criteria for Poverty Point to be the early model is trade networks. But as I'll discuss later, that was a very one-way relationship for Poverty Point. So let's start talking about the site itself. Its formation was purposeful and almost certainly employed some level of land surveying skills. When you look at the map of Poverty Point, which Google will show you in a single search, the thing that immediately stands out is the concentric semicircles at its center. There are six of them, all nested together with equal distances between. Upon first glance, the map makes them look like a classic Roman or Greek amphitheater, complete with aisles to access all the seating. But on the ground, they aren't like that at all. They're all the same height, not higher and higher levels as they go back and they cover a vastly larger space. From one end to another, they're three-fourths of a mile wide. The plaza at their center is also huge, 
43 acres. Each one of the concentric half circles are actually earthen mounds or ridges. Originally, they were about 8 feet tall and 90 feet wide, and very flat on the top. You might also look at them and think, hey, maybe they're the prototypes for the later Hopewell earthworks. But no, they're not, for a very fascinating reason. They were actually residential. Hundreds of houses were built upon them, in orderly rows along their tops. It must have looked like a modern subdivision with all of its houses in neat rows and sitting on equal parcels of land. We don't know what the houses looked like because very few post holes were found, but each had a deeply dug kitchen hearth so we can see the spacing between them. There was also quantities of daub found, so it's likely they had wattle and daub walls. Hundreds of houses imply that thousands of people were living in the city center, all in virtually equal socioeconomic status. I'm a big fan of order and symmetry, so these orderly rows of Poverty Point houses look wonderfully civilized to me. But perhaps the craziest thing about them is that they're an enigma. Nowhere else in the Americas was such an ancient housing subdivision built. In fact, in her 2015 book on Poverty Point, Archaeologist Deanna Greenlee says they were nowhere on the planet, nowhere else on the planet was such a thing built in ancient times. And yes, if you've been listening to my other episodes, you know I don't like enigmas. They make me wonder, ooh, what are we missing? I don't want to belabor the discussion of these concentric semicircles or residential terraces or whatever we should call them but I do want to address one more common question about them. That is, were they once complete circles and the changing course of the Bayou Macon just destroyed the other half? Their ends do terminate right up against the Bayou, and the interior plaza is also right along its banks. But site archaeologists specifically investigated that possibility and determined, no, they were always just semicircles. So now let's talk about the mounds. In total, six pyramid mounds are known at Poverty Point, in the immediate area that is. They're named alphabetically. Mounds A, B, and E are arranged along a north-south line just behind the concentric housing terraces on its western side. Mounds C and D are located inside the plaza, near the bayou's edge. Mount D was actually built by a later culture, and I'll return to that later. Finally, we have Mount F, found by Greenlee in 2013. It was about 80 by 100 feet in area, but it was only about 5 foot tall, hence the reason it wasn't found earlier. Beyond a carbon-14 date saying 1280 BCE, I really haven't read much more regarding Mound F. I guess they're still getting to it. As mentioned earlier, Mound B is the oldest at Poverty Point, and in some ways it was the most complex. Save Mound E, every other mound at the site was built in a single construction phase, maybe two, but Mound B had four distinct building phases. The first three are all flat-topped buildings with post holes and fire pits proving that they were topped with some kind of wooden structures. The final phase was a conical cap with a circular base, about 21 feet tall and 180 feet in its basal diameter. That makes it sound like a later Adena mound, but the big difference is that there were no burials inside. But something even more important to archaeologists was found inside. The remnants of grass-weaved baskets. Those were the baskets used for hauling basket loads of dirt to the construction site. Each could hold about 50 pounds of dirt. And that's how we can talk about how many basket loads each of the mounds took to construct. In the case of Mound B, that was 279,000 basket loads. Now that's a lot, but it pales in comparison to Mound A, 
Mound A took more like 15.5 million basket loads. And what's really mind-boggling is that it was built in a single phase, and by all accounts, quite quickly. Researchers point to the evidence that none of the interior fill looks like it was rained on to make their case for that quick construction. Amazingly, they conclude it was built in about 90 days. And I must admit, I'm a bit skeptical about that. Doing the math, 15.5 million basket loads in 90 days, I get that it would take 3,445 people each hauling 50 bags a day to make that happen. Theoretically, humans could do that. But to envision that many people working together in the bayous of Louisiana 3,500 years ago, well, that feels like a lot, doesn't it? Increasing the number of baskets per person per day would lower the amount of people needed, but there's a logical limit to that. I'm pretty sure that I couldn't carry more than a few 50-pound bags across a field before my back gave out. But regardless of how fast it was built, there's Mound A, still towering over the site today. And again, it was built by 1430 BCE. That's 100 years before King Tut was born. That leaves just two central mounds to discuss, Mounds C and E. Mound C is really not much to write home about. It's a rectangle, 260 by 80 feet at its base, but it's only about 6 foot tall. And it's got a 19th century wagon trail digging into its ridge top. There's not a whole lot to say about it. Some artifacts have been found inside, but nothing of real uh, import. Mound E was also damaged in modern times by a bulldozer in the 1970s. Still, it's 13 feet tall and 360 by 295 feet at its base. Though its top is flat, there was no evidence of a building on top. Very little was found inside, mostly stone flakes. It wasn't until 2017 when a piece of charcoal recovered from Mound E securely determined it was built around 1500 BCE. And just to put Mound E in perspective, its flat top is large enough to hold an entire football field, goalpost to goalpost, with room for bleachers on the side. So I'm not making a molehill into a mountain. Mound E is a bona fide mountain. Okay, I'll take my final commercial break here, and when I return, we'll talk about artifacts and what they say about life in Poverty Point. Yes, it's another commercial of me promoting me. This time, it's an ask to support Archeoed through Patreon. I've discovered that a lot of my listeners don't know what Patreon is, so let me explain. Simply put, Patreon is a website that allows fans to financially support their favorite creators, musicians, artists, comics, and podcasters like me. Like the NPR model, it allows for one-time donations or monthly charges on your credit card called sustaining memberships. Those sustaining memberships are wonderful because they create a monthly budget that creators can depend on and plan around. You can support ArcheoEd with as little as $5 a month or as much as you like. The process is really very simple. Just make an account with Patreon and choose ArcheoEd as your recipient. But you might be saying, but wait a second, ArcheoEd is free. Why would I choose to pay for it? Because, again, just like NPR, quality programming doesn't exist without public support. I made this podcast on a lark, sitting in my closet during the pandemic. But now it has tens of thousands of fans and dozens of Patreon supporters. Archeoed's success is starting to prove that responsible, truthful portrayals of ancient history can be popular and financially viable. Aliens, ghosts, and white guys that built Atlantis are not the only things that history fans want to hear about. So why support Archeoed through Patreon? 
so I can have the financial resources to expand my reach and increase the audience. With your help, I can challenge the notion that only sensationalized versions of ancient history sell. It's easy. Just Google Patreon Archeoed and you're on your way. I'm betting on the fact that you would agree that Archeoed is at least as valuable to you as a cup of Starbucks once a month. So come on, put a little skin in the game and help me challenge those other strange versions of history. Okay, let's start talking about Poverty Point's amazing artifact assemblage. First off, 88% of the bones found at Poverty Point are fish bones. So clearly, their subsistence strategy relied much more on fishing than it did hunting. Assumably, plants were an important part of their diet as well, but no large cultivation areas have been found. So those were probably mostly gathered wild. Modern archaeology can tell us all sorts of neat things about ancient diets from the analysis of bones and teeth. The problem is that to date we have no human bones or teeth from Poverty Point. Nothing. Not one. Not in the mounds. Not under the houses. No cemeteries found. The soils are a bit acidic, so maybe some of the bones dissolved. But that's not the complete explanation. Colonial period slave cemeteries in the area do have bones, so it's not just the soil type. Maybe someday we'll find a Poverty Point graveyard, but for now, they're ghosts. But there's another important artifact class that does tell us a little bit more about their subsistence strategies. We call them cooking balls. They're balls made of local, silty loam soil and they're baked in a fire to become hard and kind of ceramic-like. They're tiny, gumball to golf ball size, and found all over the residential concentric ridges. In fact, they're the most common artifact recovered from Poverty Point. Tens of thousands of them. They're one of a small grouping of artifact types referred to as Poverty Point Objects, or PPOs for short. PPOs are important and separately defined because they were locally made as opposed to imported. They're found in an area far larger than just Poverty Point itself and used to define the larger Poverty Point culture area. That area spreads out into the Yazoo River Basin east of the Mississippi and all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Those cooking balls were used in conjunction with the deep hearths in the house floors that I talked about earlier. The hearths were lined with silty clay, like a subsurface pot. The cooking balls would be heated up outside the pot and then thrown in to heat up water inside in order to boil and cook food. And that was probably the key to what allowed hunter-gatherers, who normally only settle in groups of about 100 at most, to gather in the thousands at Poverty Point. Food supply is a practical limit of a community's ability to grow, and cooking is likely what allowed Poverty Point to create and store surpluses. Now, one thing that Poverty Point didn't have is local stone resources. They could dig down into the bayou banks to find river cobbles, but they were mostly sandstone, no good for making tools. And yet, there's a lot of stone tools found there. Literally tons. As of the last published account in 2015, 78 tons to be exact. All of it was imported, much of it from very far away. They were getting their chert, which is the material for projectile points and knives, from Tennessee but also as far away as Ohio. Galena, a lead sulfite ore, was imported in quantity from Missouri and Iowa. They made little animal figurines in Galena, but mostly these objects that we call plummets. Plummets look like plumb bobs, and they have a little hole drilled in one end, assumably to hang them from strings. 
They've commonly been thought of as weights for fishing nets, though some archaeologists think they were weights for weaving looms. Those materials were likely imported by boats down the Mississippi, but then they also imported a ton of soapstone, and that came from Georgia and the Carolinas, which necessitated, at least in part, land trade routes. Remember that Poverty Point was pre-ceramic. The soapstone, while it was used for many things, was primarily shaped into bowls for eating and mixing things. So clearly Poverty Point had a vast trade network. But there's a problem. It appears to have been a very one-sided relationship. Nothing from Louisiana shows up in the archaeological sites in the states that they were importing from at least not during the Archaic period. They must have been trading something, but we don't know what it was. That leads me neatly into Poverty Point's legacy. Did they have one? The site is fully abandoned by 1100 BCE, and Louisiana goes dark. No one would build a mound of any size there for another thousand years. But about that same time, just as Poverty Point fades, the Adena civilization starts building huge burial pyramids in Ohio. It seems too big a stretch to say that Poverty Point was their inspiration, and none of Poverty Point's pyramid mounds contained burials. But still, the Ohio chert found at the site proves that they did have contact with that area. Are we underestimating the true scale of that contact? When the Adena morph into the Hopewell civilization around 0 CE, Hopewell trade routes and settlement patterns spread all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. And you know where their presence was strongest? In Louisiana. It's a well-established fact that the Hopewell site of Marksville in Louisiana had a healthy trade relationship with those in Ohio. In fact, some suggest that changes in Ohio ceramics were being driven by innovations originating in Marksville. And then we have the odd case of Mound D in Poverty Point's main plaza. Excavations discovered it wasn't built during Poverty Point times. Instead, it was built around 700 CE by a small group called Coles Creek Culture. 700 CE is just after Hopewell and just before Mississippian civilization emerges. But even in those quiet transitional times, Coles Creek knew where Poverty Point was and built a single structure there. I think that as time goes by, we archaeologists are going to start connecting dots that we hadn't seen before. But how about the other direction along the timeline? What was there before Poverty Point? As we're learning more and more every year, Poverty Point was part of a tradition that began over a thousand years earlier. To date, there are 16 Middle Archaic mounds known from Louisiana and neighboring Mississippi. The most famous is Watson Break a circular arrangement of mounds not too far from Poverty Point, which date to 3400 BCE. They're on private land, and the owner hasn't let major excavations go on just yet, so we only know so much about the site. Louisiana's trying to buy it now, and hopefully they will. The rangers at Poverty Point tell me that there are a few other mounds of Watson Brake's age on other privately held lands, still unnamed, or published. Then we have the crazy case of the two large mounds on the LSU campus in Baton Rouge, each about 20 foot tall. For years, they were the gathering point for LSU football tailgate parties. At one point, a drunk wrecked his truck into one of them. Then in 1982, they dug into them and discovered that they were at least 5,000 years old. Just recently, a report came out claiming that they're actually 11,500 years old, but I suspect that will be challenged. I visited them last summer. They have a chain-link fence around them and a tiny sign explaining what they were. 
While trying to find them, I asked a few people walking around the campus, and no one knew what I was talking about. Those mounds are a perfect example of how America's ancient past is right in front of our noses and we don't know it. My favorite pre-Poverty Point Pyramid mound is the one called the Lower Jackson Mound. It's only about 8 foot tall, but it's 130 feet in diameter, and it dates to about 3700 BCE. It's two miles directly south of Poverty Point's Mound A, the big one. And I mean directly south, on a perfect north-south axis. But Mound A was built 2,200 years later. Did Poverty Point remember it? And did they have the survey skills to run a north-south oriented line all the way for two miles to the new Mound A? Again, that seems hard to swallow. But what's the next best explanation? I have an equally hard time believing it's a coincidence. Well, okay, I'm going to wrap up my discussion of Poverty Point here. But as usual, there's a lot more I didn't say. For example, I didn't talk about the 51-foot-tall Motley Mound built two miles north of Poverty Point Center, or the many wood henges they're finding in Poverty Point's plaza or the wonderful owl figurines carved out of red jasper. If you're excited by or disbelieve anything I said here, I suggest you visit Poverty Point for yourself. It's open every day for visitors 9 to 5, and the rangers are some of the nicest people you'll ever meet. Tell them Ed sent you. They'll get a kick out of that. Until next month, this is Ed, signing off. You've been listening to Archeo Ed, a podcast written, produced, and distributed by me, Ed Barnhart. If you liked what you heard, then subscribe, like, share, comment, and do all those other things that I'm supposed to ask you to do. If you didn't, then don't do any of that stuff. And if you really liked it, support Archeo Ed through my Patreon account. I make these podcasts for free, but I am not opposed to financial support. Until next time, thanks for listening. All rights reserved. Copyright 2023.